Psalm 136 is a responsive psalm. So it takes some work from you. Now I'm reading from the ESV, which means it might look slightly different if you've got one of the church Bibles. Uh, There's a repeated line in every verse. It might say in your Bible, for his love endures forever. In my Bible it says, for his steadfast love endures forever. We're going to go with my Bible, if that's all right. Because I think it better captures for us what the psalmist is trying to say. So we're going to read the whole psalm. I'm going to read the first half of each verse. You're going to repeat back to me. For his steadfast love endures forever. Make sense? Great. Thumbs up from Chris. Okay, Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him alone who does great things. To him who by understanding made the heavens. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. To him who made the great light. The sun to rule over the day. The moon and stars to rule over the night. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt. And brought Israel out from among them. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea in two. And made Israel pass through the midst of it. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea. To him who led his people through the wilderness. To him who struck down great kings and killed mighty kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and gave their land as a heritage, a heritage to Israel his servant. It's he who remembered us in our lowest state and rescued us from our foes. He who gives food to all flesh. Give thanks to the God of heaven for his steadfast love endures forever. What do you think the big point of that psalm is? That's the point of a repetition, so that you get the point. His steadfast love endures forever. There's not a lot that endures forever, is there? Not many things. I think that Christmas is probably the time of year when we most feel that. Because we we look back on the 12 months prior, and we see just how much has changed since last Christmas. And so I woke up this morning, came down the stairs, my little girl's there. When I look at pictures of Christmas last year, my little girl's a baby. <laughs> she's little, she's six months old, getting all the baby cuddles like Charlie is just now. Now when I come downstairs, there she is, she's walking, she's off, she's running around, she's chatting away. She's not a baby, she's a little girl. Change. Our church has changed quite a lot in 12 months. So we've got members that weren't members last Christmas. John and Paul are here. I don't think you've even been to GCC last Christmas, had you? No. Tosin and Tosin are here. Weren't part of our church this time last year. Josh and Dylan weren't really even on the scene this time last year. Stuff changes. Some of us have changed where we live in the last 12 months. Tam and Alan have got a new home to live in. I think David and Kirsten moved in the last year as well. Stuff changes. 
Some of us were in rehab this time last year. Some of you kids who are with us uh, today, some of you were in different schools or with different teachers or in different classrooms last year. For some of us, this Christmas is going to be the first Christmas with our loved one who's died this year. That's a big change. There's not a lot that stays the same. And we really struggle with that because we really don't like change. If you're anything like me, change is kind of unsettling and it makes life feel unpredictable. And yet, not one of us can avoid change. It comes, it comes to all of us. It's part of our lives. And yet we spend loads of our lives trying to hold on to things really tightly that we can't hold on to. Things that are going to change. Things that are wasting away. Things that are deteriorating. Things that are dying. And the tighter we try to hold on, the quicker things just seem to slip through our hand like sand. We've experienced, no matter how tightly we hold on, almost everything changes. And what we find is that into that world where pretty much everything changes, God speaks. Where everything shifts and things move on, these words come from God in Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. He says, I am the Lord, I do not change. I do not change. Now we've been thinking about over the last couple of weeks, the ways in which God is incomparable. That's what we've called this little series, isn't it? The ways in which God can't be compared to anything else. He alone, we said, is eternal. We said that means he has limitless life in himself and he is the Lord over time. We said that God alone is omniscient. That means he has limitless knowledge. He knows everything. And here's the last one we're going to look at this year. God is immutable. That means he does not and he cannot change. Now we've heard a lot of stuff over the last couple of years about how COVID has changed. It's mutated. We've had lots of variants that have come about because viruses, they mutate and try and evade all the vaccines we've had jabbed in our arms. They are mutable. God is immutable. He does not change. That means that God will always unchangingly be eternal and always unchangingly be omniscient. But these three truths about God, these three attributes of God we're looking at this year, they're only three of many. There are loads of things about God that he always has been, that he is today, and that he always will be. And all that he is, he is all of the time, unchangingly, never more and never less. Because if God was one day to be less than what he is today, then he would no longer be God. He would cease to be perfect. And if God one day was to be more than what he is today, then he wouldn't have been God today. Because he wouldn't have been perfect. But this God, who reveals himself in the scriptures to us, this God says, I am the Lord and I do not change. Now, if you look around the room today, and you see all the kids that are with us. All of these kids have a bunch of potential. They're going to grow bigger. They're going to learn loads of stuff. They could do all kinds of things with their lives. We don't know. And actually, it's the same for every one of us. I don't think any of us would sit here today and say, I've reached my full human potential. Certainly as Christians, we wouldn't say, I've reached my full potential as a Christian. All of us could be kinder. All of us could be more generous. All of us could be more gracious. All of us could be gentler, more discerning, more honest. All of us could be more patient and more thankful, more self-controlled. Every one of us could be more loving. God, though, has no potential. He already is everything that he could be all the time. 
There are no areas of development for God to work on. He already is everything that he is and ever will be. He's not only eternal, he's omniscient. He's not only omniscient, he's omnipotent. That means he has all power, limitless power. He's omnipresent, that means he has limitless presence. He's here and he's everywhere else. He's self-existent and he's self-dependent. That means God doesn't need anything outside of himself to be what he is. He's perfectly holy. He's perfectly wise. He's gracious and he's merciful. He's long-suffering and he's full of goodness and he's full of truth. He's faithful and he's forgiving. He's just in all of his judgments and he's right in his judgment against sin. He is love and he is loving. And all of these things, he is in their fullness all of the time. He always has been and he always will be the same. Now if you think about how much Keenan Prime or Angus Finlayson has changed in a year or a few months, it's mind blowing the rate of a baby's development. But this God, given 10,000, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000 years, does not change a single bit. He is always the same. Now, I don't know if you're a movie fan. If you're a movie fan, you might have seen some of the Batman films. There's a Batman trilogy that's decent. There's others that aren't so good. If you've seen The Dark Knight, anybody seen that film? Yes. So, there's a bit at the end of that film where Batman, the goodie, kind of captures the Joker, the baddie, and at the end of the film, he has him hanging at the top of this building upside down, uh, kind of trapped by his leg. Now, the, the dilemma in that instance is Batman doesn't want to kill him because Batman's so good. And yet the Joker's not going to kind of repent of his ways and become good because he's so bad. And does anyone remember what it is that the Joker says? in that moment, as he's hanging upside down. It's quite an impressive clarity of thought, hanging upside down. He says, this is what happens when, there's a test for you, remember? Go on, Cameron. Yes, mate, superb. This is what happens when an immovable object meets an unstoppable force. Now when we think about God not changing, we quite often think about an immovable object. We think of something like a mountain. Something that doesn't change because it just stays still. It doesn't do anything. Well in this little phrase, God isn't the immovable object. God is the unstoppable force. God is the one who at all times is active. At all times he is actively everything that he is to the fullest that he could be. He's not static. He's on the move. Someone said, God is at full volume all of the time. He can never be any less. He can never be any more. And what I want us to see this morning as we look at this attribute of God, his immutability, his unchangingness, is the vital connection that exists between God's unchangingness and your and my savability as sinners. There's something that ties these things together that is essential. Let me read the rest of that verse in Malachi 3, 6 to you. God says, I, the Lord, do not change. So, you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Now let me try and summarise Psalm 136 for you that we read together. It tells the story of God's great deeds for his people over the course of history because his steadfast love endures forever. That's what Psalm 136 is about. Not because his people deserved his great deeds. Not because his people loved him with a love that endured forever. But because his steadfast love endures forever. Now the reason that I like my Bible on Psalm 136 
is the word that's translated steadfast love. It speaks of something that is talking about God's loving covenant faithfulness. His loving covenant faithfulness. Now because God is a God whose character never changes, he's also a God who has a plan that never changes and who makes promises that never change. He's not like me, all right? So if I take Claire out for a meal, which happens occasionally, and we get to the restaurant, I used to be so bad at choosing something off a menu that Claire would send me the menu either that day or the day before in advance so I could have a decent look over it. And almost without fail, I'll choose something off the menu, food will arrive, and I'll wish that I ordered what Claire had ordered. God's not like that. He doesn't change his mind. He never changes his mind. Everything that God does, he does with his own unchangeable plan, based on his own unchangeable character. And one of the things that the unchangeable God has done is to make unchanging promises. Now in the Bible, promises, God's promises to his people, can be summed up in something called a covenant. Now a covenant is, it's like a, a contract of promise between two parties. So we quite often talk about a marriage covenant when people get married. Two parties make promises to one another. Or, or we have a church covenant that we as members promise to one another. Now covenants in the ancient worlds were initiated by an agreement of the price that would be paid should the covenant promises be broken. You with me? An agreement of what would be paid. And so I'm going to try and give you a, a, a bit of a sweep of what this idea of covenant promises does through the whole of Scripture, right at the start of the Bible in the first book, Genesis chapter 15, we find a man called Abram and we find God making a covenant promise to Abraham. Now Abram's descendants would go on to become the people of God in the Old Testament. Abraham is the granddad of a guy called Jacob, who we saw in Malachi 3.6, has sons, a family. These are the people of God sometimes called Israel, sometimes called the sons of Abram, sometimes called the sons of Jacob. And this is what God said to Abram. I will be your God, and I will be the God of your descendants, and I will make you into, the, into a great nation, and I will give you a land in which to live. And in order to confirm this covenant promise, God told Abram to bring a bunch of animals. So God said, bring a cow and bring a goat, and bring a ram, and bring a turtle dove, like in the Christmas song, and bring a pigeon, and bring these animals and slaughter them. And now it gets a bit more gory than slaughter them. God says, cut them in half, and lay them out on the ground. And that night, the Spirit of God passed between these pieces of slaughtered animals. And it was as if God was saying as he passed between them, if I do not keep these covenant promises that I have made to you today, let it be done to me as has been done to these animals and birds. Let me be slaughtered and let me be cut in half and let my parts be scattered on the floor if I do not keep my promises to you. God's promise to his people. Now as we move on in the Bible, we hit the second book, the book of Exodus. And in the second book, we find that Abraham and Jacob's offspring, they've bred, they've reproduced, they've turned into a nation of thousands, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, and they've become a whole nation. And we find in the book of Exodus the way that God rescues this nation of people from brutal slavery in a place called Egypt, and leads them out, and leads them through the wilderness. We, we saw that described in Psalm 136. And he leads them through the wilderness, miraculously guiding, miraculously providing, until they hit a place called Mount Sinai. It's a mountain. 
And at Mount Sinai, God gives to his people the Ten Commandments. If you want to find out where the Ten Commandments come from, that's where they come from. Exodus chapter 20. And he gives to his people who he has rescued a way that they should live in light of his goodness to them. And the leader of God's people, a guy called Moses, he brings all these commandments to the, the people of God, the nation. And he reads them out to the people. And all the people answer with one voice. All the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses takes some bulls this time. And he has them slaughtered. And he has the blood collected. And half the blood is put into bowls. And Moses again reads out this thing called the Book of the Covenant to the people. And again, all of the people answer with one voice together. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And we will be obedient. And then Moses sprinkles the blood out on the people. Sounds awful, doesn't it? He's glad that we don't do that anymore. And as these like, blood-spattered people stand before Moses, they say all together, if we don't keep our promises to our God that we have made today, let it be done to us as has been done to these bulls. Let us be slaughtered and let our blood be poured out and let it be spread across the ground if we do not keep these promises to be obedient to our God that we have made today. The God who rescued us. Now here's the problem. Within days, these people had melted down all of their gold and jewellery to construct for themselves an idol in the shape of a cow to worship and say, here is the God that rescued us from slavery in Egypt. Breaking commandment number one. And worshipping a thing that ought to have reminded them of the bulls that were slaughtered as part of their promise. Within days, See, the difference between God and his people is laid bare. God makes an unchanging promise that he keeps to a T. And we, within days, moments, break our promises, are disobedient and sin. And so God was angry. And he was angry with the righteous anger of a good God towards evil. This covenant had been agreed by both parties and the agreed price of breaking this covenant promise was death. It was destruction. And yet what we find is though God's anger burns hot against his people's sin, he turns his burning hot anger away from his people. And he announces to Moses who he is. And he wants us to know who he is. This is what God says about himself to Moses after his people have broken their promise to him. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. Instead of ripping up the promises that God had made to his people, instead what he does is he renews them. He says again to them, I will be your God. And he says to them, I will do marvels in your presence that haven't been seen before. I will do an awesome thing with you. And God was going to have to do an awesome thing that had never been seen before. And this is where the immutability, the, the unchanging of God, comes together with the incarnation of Christmas at this time of year. This is not a God who can simply clear the guilty. He does not change. He is burning hot in his holiness. He's righteous 
and he's just. Which means that blood had to be shed for sin as it was agreed. He does not change. And yet, God says of himself, he is merciful and he is gracious. He's slow to anger and he's abounding in steadfast love. He keeps all of his promises. He can't change. And so here's the question. What does it take for God to uphold in the, the same moment the, the righteous justice of God against covenant-breaking people and the mercy and grace of a God who is abounding in steadfast love? How can the unchangingly holy and unchangingly loving God bring about his unchanging plan to save sinners as he has promised? So that all of his mercy and justice and all of his goodness and holiness and all of his love and righteousness could be seen and could be heard by people at full volume. How? An awesome thing. Somebody had to die. It had been agreed. Somebody had to die like those animals. Someone who, unlike us, wouldn't disobey and therefore deserve death. And yet, someone who would keep all of his promises. And yet, and here's the mystery, someone who, unlike the unchangeable God, could die. Someone who, with the unchanging faithfulness of God, had flesh that could be torn and blood that could be spilled. Someone. And this is what's being born to Mary in that nativity scene at Christmas time. God. But with a head that could be scratched by thorns. And with a, a back that could be torn open by a whip. And with hands and feet that could be pierced by nails. And with a side that could be pierced by a spear. And with lungs that could struggle and gasp against the weight of his own body and then breathe their last. And someone with a heart that could beat and then beat no more. And someone with eyes that could see the people standing around and mocking him. And someone with ears that could hear all of it. And someone even with a human soul that could bear all of the weight of our shame and guilt that our sin has brought. Someone. For a bunch of promise-breaking, sin-loving, death-deserving people like us. The one who is promise-keeping, sin-hating, life-giving, would take on a human nature. That's what's wonderful about Christmas. Born as a baby called Jesus, in order to fulfill all of the unchanging God's unchanging plans and unchanging promises. The baby in the nativity would grow and make a payment with his own blood in order to overcome the unfaithfulness of his people and to confirm a better covenant. To bring into being a better covenant in which the price has been paid in advance. Not as a demonstration of what will be needed from sinners, but as a price paid in advance. Not based on our family lineage, Not based on our nationality. Not based on our obedience, but so that all who trust in Jesus will be saved. It's good news. Not because we deserve it. Not because we love him. But because his steadfast love his loving covenant faithfulness endures forever. It does not, and it cannot change. And so here's what you need to know about the incarnation that we celebrate at Christmas. It isn't a change in the unchanging God's plan. The thing that feels tricky about the unchanging God becoming man is that it feels like a change. The thing that feels tricky in the Old Testament about a God who burns white hot against sin 
and yet chooses to relent of destroying those people is that it feels like a change. And yet what we find at Christmas is that it's only as these things are brought together, the white hot anger of God against sin, the unfaithfulness of his people, and the incarnation of his son, it's only as these things come together that we see this has always been the plan. That this cross was never plan B. Think about this. God planned and God promised to save a sinner like you when he knew you would be unfaithful and disobedient because his steadfast love endures forever. And because in the cross, our tiny little heads get to see as best we can and our ears get to hear at as full volume as we can who God is in all of his mercy and justice, his love and his righteousness, his goodness and his holiness, that he would come to bleed the blood that your sins deserve. It's an awesome thing that he has done. Now here are what I think are three implications that change our lives today of the unchanging God becoming man. Here's the first one. Because his character is unchanging, you can't catch him on a bad day. You can catch me on a bad day. Probably more days than not, actually. You can't catch this God on a bad day. His love for you today, think about this. His love for you today is exactly the same as it was on that day when Jesus died for you. And it will be just the same tomorrow. He cannot and he will not love you any more or any less. Now there's a thing called the stability index that the social use with kids, particularly kids that are in care, to see how constant and stable their lives have been because they know how important it is for kids to have stability for their development, for their well-being. Here's a God who in any and every situation is the same. Here's a God who will never, ever change. A lot of stuff changes in Psalm 136. But his steadfast love endures forever. And so when the things of this life change, when things even today change, as relationships break down, and as loved ones die, as they will do, and as our health deteriorates, and as our bodies and our minds age, and as our circumstances change, and as our obedience to him falters and fails, here is a God who doesn't change a bit. That you can look back to that cross and see the love on display that he has for you today. And in those moments when you're fearful about the future, and you're filled with trepidation about all the unknowns, you can look back at that cross and you can know tomorrow and the next day and the next day his love for you will be just the same. It will not change. As everything else changes, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Here's the second thing. Because his plan and his promises are unchanging, you can take him at his word. Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. That is a trustworthy saying. He's a God who cannot change his promises. And so if you're trusting in Jesus today, you can have complete assurance and complete confidence that you will have eternal life with him in heaven one day. You will not perish because his love for you endures forever. The payment has been made and it cannot change. And because God keeps the promises that he makes, the door to eternal life is open today. And you might be here today and you've been here a couple of times. You might be here and you've been here hundreds of times. God has been very patient with you as he has been with me. And the amazing thing about God's promise is that there is a way today that is open for you to come and to have eternal life. 
He is faithful to his promises. There is a way that you can come and hear his announcement of who he is at full volume and have the eternal life he promises. You don't deserve it, but he loves you. You can't afford it, but he's made the payment for you. And Jesus is offered to you today as a way to eternal life. But if you can take him at his word when he promises eternal life to all who believe in his son, you can also take him at his word when he says outside of his son there is only perishing and destruction. You can believe this clause because he does not change. Here's the third thing. Because he alone is unchanging, it is possible for you to change. In the next couple of weeks, a bunch of us are going to be making New Year's resolutions, which are going to last until about February. And it seems to me that we as Christians, a bunch of us in this room, find ourselves stuck in this New Year's resolution that fails by February kind of mode when it comes to our Christian lives. I cannot change. No matter how hard I've tried, I just cannot change. I've been struggling with this thing for so long and I cannot change. Let me assure you this morning, God alone is immutable. You are not unchangeable. You can change. And this God's desire for you is for your good and for your growth. And the beautiful thing about the gospel is it doesn't end with the cross. Because the one who died didn't stay dead. And while in the incarnation he comes and makes himself like us, what we see in the resurrection is his promise to one day make us like him. And so if you're struggling in your Christian life today, and you feel like there is no progress, I've made no progress since last Christmas, you can know today there is an unchanging promise to you from the unchanging God. That those he loves, he will put his spirit into. And that his spirit can help you to change. The immutable God can change you to be more and more like Jesus, who is the same yesterday and today and forever and ever.